This is Radio TV Phono Nut, and today we have an Arvin solid state, high fidelity, uh, portable record player from 1966. And of course, we all know this is not true high fidelity, but back in the 50s and 60s, they tended to slap that phrase on just about everything. Let's open it up and have a look at it. Just a basic mono record player with volume and tone controls and a BSR record changer. Still has the 45 RPM record adapter. Back around 1996, I went to an estate sale. It was actually a living estate sale. The elderly lady was preparing to move to an assisted living facility and was selling off of her stuff. And it was getting towards the end of the day, and I noticed over by the back door a little record player and a stack of 45 RPM records and I asked her what she wanted for the record player and she said well it don't work so you know how, to, how does $3 sound and I'll throw in the records and I said okay and I brought it home and repaired it and gave it away or sold it off or done something with it and then all these years later I was on one of the auction sites and saw one just like it so I thought I'd get it and you know just hang on to this one hopefully unfortunately it wasn't three dollars it seems like you can't get these kind of things for three bucks anymore and just about all of the older people that had stuff like this is they're now no longer with us so you know it's getting harder to find this stuff out in the wild at the state sales and when you do find it, it's usually the the usual, uh, well, we looked it up on eBay, and it's worth $10 million crap, so, and that's when I tell them, we'll just go ahead and sell it on eBay. All right, enough rambling, let's, let's get it down to the shop and see what we can do with it. Now, it just came to me what happened to my old Arvin record player, a TV shop that I helped out every now and then whenever I was a teenager, took in a beat the heck DECA record player just like this from about the same time period as the Arvin and he asked me to fix it and I took one look at it and said no way unless the owner has a bunch of money well that wasn't the case so I think I we ended up just selling him my old Arvin record player for 15 or 20 bucks and he insisted on wanting his old DECA back, so we gladly let him have it back because it was a piece of garbage anyway. This one here is about the same age as the Arvin, and uh, it was an eBay purchase, and it was sent to me by some dimwit that didn't know how to pack, and you can see the speaker enclosure got dented. This was an entry-level model that uses a Maestro record changer, and they're probably will be a video on this one day so give you something to look forward to yeah I'm getting so that I'm buying less and less on eBay and it's mainly because of the poor packing situation it seems like 95 percent of what I get is packed poorly and some of it like this record player is damaged and then they're charging too much money for this stuff now and if you find something that is reasonably priced they have the shipping jacked up through the stratosphere and I'm just not going to do that. I've built up quite a collection over the past 30 years. I've got enough stuff to keep me busy probably for the rest of my life and if I find something locally then we'll go for it but this this online buying is just becoming too much of a hassle. Okay enough rambling on let's evaluate this record player. I can tell you that it has one thing in common with the old Arvin that I had. They both have bad filter capacitors and they both have about the same degree of hum, so that will have to be fixed first. Here's the inside. This appears to be an American made unit with a mix of American and Japanese parts. We have our little Japanese speaker that looks to be about a whole three by five. And most of these types of record players have a separate winding on the on the turntable motor to provide a low AC voltage to be rectified and used by the amplifier. This one is not that way. This amplifier is driven directly off of the AC power line 
and they use high voltage on the final output transistor and they use a dropping resistor to bring the B plus voltage down for our driver transistor here and it is nice enough for them to give us a schematic although we probably won't need it here's our two section filter capacitor can that's bad that we'll have to replace and it is a 150 microfarad and then 100 microfarad. We should be able to come up with close enough values for that. Okay, there they are soldered in place except for cutting off the excess. And this must be my week for factory boo-boos because I just happened to touch the electrolytic capacitor that's next to this main filter capacitor and watch that lead here. You see it wiggling like crazy, which tells us it wasn't soldered good. And while we're here, we might as well pull it out and check it. It's one of those Japanese capacitors. It's often trashed by now anyway. Okay, here we are. Capacitors changed. Pots cleaned. Let's put the changer back in and see if we get some kind of amplifier action. All right, let's see. Well, the loud hum went away. And the amplifier is working. Although I'm not getting much of a buzz, but that's to be expected for this type of amp. It needs a, this is one of those that needs a high output crystal cartridge on the order of maybe three volts to get good volume out of it. And that's what we have here. And how much money you want to bet that the cartridge is bad? Let's find out. Alright, we're turned on, volume cranked up. Do I get any noise? Just as I suspected, this cartridge is dead as a doornail. And we're getting a hum through the tone arm wiring, so that tells us that it is indeed the cartridge that's shot. And what is this cartridge? It looks like the equivalent to an Estatic 146, which was a popular mono half-inch mount 3-volt crystal cartridge, and 99.9% .9 of them are dead by now. This one is actually an Electro Voice 5549, made in Japan which is, I believe, the same thing as, as an Estatic 146. At least the nice thing here is that we have a half-inch mount, so we can mount a modern Fansteel P226, but the problem with that is that's only a half a volt cartridge, so we're probably not going to have much volume here unless I construct a preamp circuit like I've done in the past. Now, the VM site, I just noticed, has a new supply of Estatic 146s, but they're about $28 versus about uh, $18 or $19 for the P226. And I'm always a little bit leery about using new old stock crystal cartridges. Even though they may have plenty of output, the compliance may not be worth a darn, and usually that's because this rubber saddle here that you see that the needle rides on, over the years it becomes hard as a rock and is not as flexible as it used to be, and that's exactly what's happened here. I'm having to push on it like crazy to get it to move. So, easiest thing to do would be to put a, find a new old stock crystal cartridge but it would be a crapshoot as to how well it would work. The best thing to do would be to put a modern low output ceramic in here and add a preamp stage. Okay I found this cartridge. This is the one that came out of that uh, one tube wonder symphonic that we EOL'd a while back and all I knew about it is it had output but that's about the extent of it. Well, anyway, since it was a 3-volt cartridge, I installed a needle on it, installed it in this tone arm, and number one, it sounded like total garbage, and I don't know how well the camera's picking it up, but you can see where it gouged out a portion of our test record here, and if it would do that to a vinyl pressing, uh, if I've tried to play a styrene pressing on it, it would probably cut clean through the record. So, uh... I dug around and found a P226 or a P228. They're both the same cartridge. I don't know why they have different numbers. And as I expected, it's a little weak, but it's not as bad as I thought it would be, and it's not gouging the record. 
mechanism needs the usual overhaul. In fact, it was running very slow for a couple of minutes and then it kicked off and that's usually a sign of a gummy motor. Still a little slow, but I'll show you where we are. And you can see it won't quite switch to off. Another sign of a gummy mechanism. Now this thing gets pretty loud on these uh, louder 45s, such as the Motown 45s. But you know, on newer records and LPs, it's a good bit quieter. Might need the preamp, but that's not something that I'm going to do in this video. That's not a necessity right now. The reason a lot of these Motown label 45s were cut loud is so they would sound decent on cheap record players like One Tube Wonders. You know, they could get as much volume as they could out of them. Now, these BSR changers are usually fairly simple to get going properly, but first we need to pop the clip off here and lift the turntable platter off. Alright, here we are with the platter removed and the main points of interest right now is to remove this cycling cam gear by removing this clip and working the gear off cleaning all of the grease out of the track uh, taking this trip lever apart and cleaning it up where it will move freely it must move very freely and while we have that off we'll need to remove these washers and our bearing assembly clean all that out real good with rubbing alcohol and re-lubricate with the non-vaginal phono lube and we'll need to take our motor out and that's accomplished by prying off these three retainer clips and make sure not to lose any of the washers that are also present and we'll take the motor apart clean it out with alcohol and a q-tip and then re-lubricate with the zoom spout and it should be good to go we'll take this item a wheel off and clean it with rubber renew although I will say these BSR item a wheels usually hold up about the only time I have to replace one is whenever it's left in gear and not and not used for a number of years while left in gear and it will cause a a notch to form in the wheel but other than that usually all you have to do is clean them up and they're good to go and then we'll clean the inside rim of our platter with the rubbing alcohol as well as the center hole there in the platter. Get all the old grease out. BSR is notorious for using grease that turns to glue after several decades. However, I don't think these 60s record changers are as bad as the ones from the 70s and early 80s. Those get so solid that you can't even rotate the platter and and if you're not careful, if you try to force it like some people do, it will cause further damage. Well, look what came off of the inner rim of the turntable platter. You need to make sure all of your driving surfaces are as clean as possible, and you don't even want to get the slightest amount, even the most microscopic amount of stray lubricant, either on the turn inner rim of the turntable, the idle or wheel surface itself, or the motor capstan because if you do that will cause you trouble everything has to be nice and grippy and everything in order for this to operate properly here's our cycling cam gear look at all that gunk now, sometimes you'll run into one of these it's so stuck that you can't simply lift it off of the shaft here and if that happens you can use heat from a soldering iron or a cigarette lighter or small torch or heat gun or whatever to heat this up and that will cause the the grease to soften and you can lift it off but we need to clean all of this off all of this sloppy slopped on mess off and re-lubricate it we have our paper towel dipped in rubbing alcohol we need to clean all this off 
By the way, when you're working on a record changer, you need to have lots of paper towels and Q-tips on hand. Preferably a whole roll of paper towels will be nice. So we just keep doing this until we get all of the old grease off and then we'll do the same to our gear here and use Q-tips to get out what we can easily reach with the paper towels. And we got this area pretty clean. We're now working on the cam gear and you can see the the yummy looking grease that we've gotten out of it so far. But we'll want to clean it thoroughly including cleaning out this center hole. All of the old grease has to go. Q-tips are handy for getting down in this little area here and getting all the old grease out and if you get some that wants to be stubborn you can use a a small very small bladed screwdriver or exacto knife or something like that to get in here and get the remainder out okay that's pretty clean we'll work on it a little more before we put it back but now we need to address this trip lever here but before we do that, I'll mention that when you service one of these, it might look like that grease is slopped on all over the place in areas where it really doesn't need to be. And that's, in, that's indeed the case, because when these record changers were built, they were obviously built in a hurry in an assembly line fashion, and they of, often didn't pay meticulous attention to detail where to put the grease. It just got slopped on in the general area where it needed to be and that's the way it went but whenever you're redoing this thing one of these you're not running an assembly line process so you can be more careful about doing that and be neater with it now we need to pop this little clip off here and do it very carefully with a small screwdriver and clean all of that up and then put a, just a little drop of zoom spout oil on that shaft. Don't get carried away with it because we need this to move as freely as possible. This is not the most stuck up one that I've ever seen but it's not the freest either. If this is not free you'll have problems with your automatic reject at the end of the record or you'll have trouble with the tone arm getting stuck before it gets to the end of the record and that could cause uh, groove skipping. And if this cycling cam gear is jammed on its shaft, then you'll also have problems with your automatic function. So that's why everything needs to move freely. And then we'll pull all these washers off and the bearing assembly, clean all of them thoroughly, make sure all the bearings rotate freely once they're clean, and then repack everything with phono lube, and then that should take care of that part. Okay, we have our center bearing and associated components cleaned and lubricated with the with the phono lube as well as our cycling cam gear. Everything moves nice and freely now. Uh, I've removed the idler wheel from its shaft here. And when you take the idler wheel off, you'll notice that there will be a couple of brownish washers here, fiber washers, one below and one above the wheel. You don't want to lose them, and also don't lose the little E-clip that holds the wheel on. And once you get that off, you need to clean everything here with rubbing alcohol, as well as treat the surface of the idler wheel with rubber renew. That'll kind of help it regain some of its grip grippiness. Like I said, the BSR wheels generally don't go bad unless somebody leaves the the function switch in the in the on position for an extended period of time. The motor mounts, these look okay, but if yours are hardened or crumbling apart, you can get those from Antique Electronic Supply or the voiceofmusic.com. And to get the motor out, you just pop off three little E-clips here and then there will be a washer under each clip. You don't want to lose those and once you drop, get those clips off the motor will just drop out of position. And then you'll need to take the motor apart with your standard hand tools and separate everything and then clean out the bearings and the the shaft with Q-tips, paper towels, etc. dipped in alcohol and then re-lubricate everything with the zoom spout if you don't have zoom spouts, you can use the blue 3-in-1 oil that's designed for motors. 
do not under any circumstances use WD-40 or the red stuff. That will gum up a motor. In fact, a lot of people think that all there is to servicing a record changer is slapping a new needle on it and hosing the mechanism down with WD-40. Well, doing that is generally a big mistake anyway, and there's a lot more to it than that. Now, before we take this motor apart, you notice it spins, but it really doesn't spin very long, and it comes to an abrupt stop, so that tells me that it's probably full of gunk. So let's take it apart and clean it. Oh, and one other thing I've noticed about these BSR motors is the shaft likes to get gunked up, I think, with with crud off of the idler wheel and dirt and you know when you combine that with a hot motor it just makes a mess you know you can clean what you can off with the alcohol but a lot of times I'll get it off by energizing the motor and just holding the blade of a screwdriver up to the capstan for a second and that'll usually get the crud off of it and here we are all apart and ready to be cleaned and one other little service hint is when you take the motor apart and put it back together, pay attention to which way this is oriented. Don't accidentally flip it around because if you do, the motor will run backwards. I know somebody on one of the record player groups recently acquired an Audiotronics school phonograph from eBay, and when they got it, the platter was turning backwards. And they were baffled by what to do, and... I told them, well, somebody that didn't know what they were doing worked on it. Take it apart, pull your motor apart, flip the flip the uh, motor assembly around in the other direction, and it'll run in the correct rotation. Now, the way I like to do this is stick the whole Q-tip down in here, but on this one, the, the, the hole is too small for the Q-tip to fit effectively, so I like to do what I can with the Q-tip intact and then I'll cut a little bit of the fuzzy off and keep working our way down in there and eventually I'll cut most of the fuzzy off and just work our way down in the bearing and you see the black crap that we're getting out of there. Okay, that's nice and clean down there and remember our Q-tip is dipped in rubbing alcohol when we're doing this. And we'll take our paper towel and clean this portion of the motor shaft and then we'll clean the top side as best we can. I'd really like to take our bearing assembly off, but getting this sleeve off of here can be a royal pain in the butt. It's usually not necessary anyway. We can usually clean it up satisfactory with the bearing assembly still in place. The best way to clean this is with a Q-tip dipped in alcohol. We just you know, we drop things in the process. That's why I need both hands to do this. But yeah, we just get out in here with the Q-tip dipped in alcohol and we keep running it around our shaft here until we get all the black crud off. Okay, we have everything cleaned up. We'll apply some zoom spout around the shaft and you want to remember there's wicking around the, around the bushings. You want to get that nice and saturated. And it's nice while we're working to nice while we're working to be able to watch a little A-team on the little 40-year-old RCA black and white TV. Okay, we have the motor back together, and when you're reassembling one of these motors, you want to make sure the bearings are aligned, and the best way to do that is tap on all sides of the motor with a rubber mallet or the butt end of a screwdriver as you're tightening things down, and constantly make sure that everything turns freely. As you can see, it does turn freely and we have good spin down time. It's much better than it was before we cleaned it and lubricated it, so we ought to be good to go as far as the motor. Oh, and by the way, when you're lubricating this, it's inevitable you're probably going to get some oil on the capstan, so before you, probably one of the last things you want to do before you put the idler wheel back on is, well, first wash your hands and make sure any lubricants off of them. And then clean the, and then clean the capstan with a rag dip, paper towel, paper towel dipped in alcohol, and make sure you get all of the lubricant off. So like I said, you don't need any lubricant at all on any of your driving surfaces. Okay, we're back on the 
BSR record changer. It's another day. Done a little more work to this. Uh, cleaned up this area here on the function select lever and it it moves nice and free now. So it should have no problem shutting off. And now we need to deal with the speed mechanism. I also cleaned this area up here and it moves freer but I think we need to clean the shaft here where the the outer wheel assembly rides up and down because it's having a little trouble moving up to the 16 RPM position. I think a little degunking will take care of that and once we've done that we should be able to hopefully put it back together and give it a test run. I'm cleaning this shaft with a Q-tip dipped in alcohol. You can see we're getting some crud off of it. And another proper thing to do would be to tear all this mechanism out and really give it a good cleaning, but I'm being a little lazy today. I'm going to try to clean it the best I can with this all assembled, and it's been my experience. They'll generally work for a number of years. Okay, I applied a few drops of Zoom Spout to the end of this Q-tip and coated the the rod here with a slight coating of oil, and I cleaned this area up here, put a drop of oil there, and the speed selector mechanism is moving as it should now. 16, 33, 45, 78. 45, 33, 16. You can see it's moving just as it should now. Okay, I think we're about ready to put the idler wheel back on and give it a test run. Or actually what I'm going to do is install this back in the record player. I'm going to make sure my hands are clean of any kind of lubricant. We'll energize the motor and clean the capstan here very thoroughly with a paper towel dipped in rubbing alcohol. Then we'll put a slight bit of phono lube on this idler shaft here and slide the bottom washer down over the shaft carefully slide the wheel down over the shaft without touching the rubber surface if possible. Slide the top washer on top of the wheel. Clip it down with the E-clip here. And then we'll slide the platter back down being careful that the wheel doesn't inter interfere with the platter being reinstalled. And then hopefully this record changer will work again. Here we are cleaning the motor capstan with the paper towel dipped in rubbing alcohol. Make sure we get all of the dirt and possible lubricant that might have got on here off. Because like I've already said about five times at least, we don't need any of that getting on our, on our driver, drive surfaces. Because it will cause wow and flutter and stalling and in extreme cases the platter won't even rotate. And looking at our drive wheel, and yes my hands are clean and I'm not touching the driving surface. It's nice and clean looking. It's not glazed or hardened. It's nice and pliable so this wheel should be good to go for a long time. Like I said before, these BSR wheels generally don't give a lot of trouble except for the notch that they develop when somebody leaves the function switch in the on position when the unit is not plugged in and operating. Okay, there we go. Wheels back on. It turns nice and freely. And when you uh, reinstall this, you want to make sure this bracket here rests up against this piece here. Now let's put the turntable platter back on and that simply just involves lowering it down over the spindle and then we'll see if our operation has improved any or did I really make a huge mess out of this. You might remember me saying in an earlier, earlier video like several years ago that I'm really not a record changer guy, I'm more of a chassis guy but you know I've learned some of the over the years I've learned some of the basic things that need to be done to these to get them to operate. Here we are, 78. 
45, 33, and 16. And it's got torque for days. Okay, let's try 45 on it and see how it operates. Okay. It shuts off. Nice. Okay, let's try a 12-inch and see if it goes to the proper location. All right, we're set to 33 and a third RPM. Yes, 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 yes. couple more things I need to address but maybe not in this video I think there's a pin that keeps this overarm in the correct position I think that pin is either broken off or damaged and as you can see the result this overarm will slide back to this position if you're not careful and that could depending on how many records you have on the stack hit the tone arm and cause it to skate across the record and we obviously don't want that and one other thing you can do to make sure this overarm slides down a little bit smoother is clean this area here with the alcohol and Q-tips and paper towels and just put a light coating of Zoom Spout on it and that will allow the overarm to slide down more gently. Now there's one other thing, a lot of times these tone arms won't uh, land on the correct portion of the record, either they'll go too far in or they won't go in far enough and there's an adjustment screw to take care of that, let me find it, that's it right there. Now you don't have to turn it much and it's a trial and error adjustment, you just uh, turn it and test it and turn it and test it until you achieve the desired results. All right, here's a 10 inch 78. This is Cowboy Copus with Boomerang. A very worn out copy I might add. I put my dreams in a dreamboat and sailed it to you. Then Boomerang All right, there we go. Uh, don't know what we'll do about the preamp. We're not going to do that in this video. I can tell you that. I might address that later, but right now this thing is usable. Okay, thanks for watching, and more to come later.